It's NPR's All Things Considered. I'm No Adams. Today on our series, Lost and Found Sound, a mystery on shortwave radio. For much of the last century, shortwave was the only way to hear radio broadcasts from thousands of miles away. Today, even with the advent of satellite and Internet broadcasting, a quick twist of the shortwave dial can still take you around the world. Among a vast array of electronic noises, shortwave enthusiasts strain to hear through the whoosh of fading signals. The truly possessed sift among them, trying to identify every transmission. Producer David Gorin has this story about a mysterious group of stations whose origin remains obscure. The first time I heard a Spanish numbers lady, I was a kid, lying in bed, tuning around on my uncle's old shortwave radio. I was baffled by the solitary voice. She's still on the air, and even though I've heard her in one form or another since the early 70s, the sound of her voice continues to haunt me. Ever since I was 13, I've scoured the shortwave bands for exotic signals. It's hard not to stumble over a number station. When I first heard them, no one seemed to know anything about them. By the end of the 70s, they acquired a following. A hardcore group of listeners continued to obsessively tape and analyze these stations. They give them catchy nicknames, like the Boardman and Bulgarian Betty. Hugh Stegman tracks the numbers for Monitoring Times, a journal for hardcore radio listeners. They're encrypted messages to somebody. We think it's to spies, we hope it's just to spies, nothing more sinister than that. A number station is defined as any of several hundred shortwave radio broadcasters, all of which are using high power, big transmitters, large antennas, global coverage of the entire planet, which do nothing except broadcast meaningless strings of numbers. They never say why they're doing it, they never say who they are. My take on the numbers transmissions is that they're the evil twin of a standard shortwave station. They have announcers and programming of a sort. They even adhere to a vintage shortwave tradition, the interval signal. This is a little ditty played a few minutes before the main broadcast to help the listener find and fine-tune the signal. Next comes the header. Three, nine, seven, one, five. It could mean Three, who the message nine, is for. Seven, it could mean there isn't any message. Five. The header is followed usually by something that lets people know the header is over. The CIA likes to beat. Other stations do other strange things. Ready? Ready? Three, five. Then they usually go into the message, which is a series of number groups, four or five numbers. I'm envisioning myself as a lonely agent sitting in the basement in some urban area. I have no friends. I'm far from home and far from my family. And this is my communication. This is my link back to my world. So I'm very carefully recording this message. Tell me something. I say again. I asked Bruce Schneier, a leading academic photographer, why an intelligence agency would communicate with an agent in the field in such an open way. It seems to be a relic of the Cold War. We always think of the radio as mass broadcast. You speak on the radio and everybody listens. This is an example of radio being used to talk to one particular person. You encrypt the message, which allows you to use this public broadcast medium to send a private message. That's really very pretty. The CIA does it, Russia does it, Cuba does it, the British do it, everybody does it. Hugh Stegman. Okay, evidence. That's a problem. There's never anything that hard. I've always assumed these are using a one-time pad or a variant, which are theoretically unbreakable given the assumptions of only having the ciphertext or only having what's broadcast on the stations. 
A one-time pad is a page of random numbers, which is the key used to encrypt and then decrypt the message. The sender and recipient each have a copy. The pad is used once and then destroyed. It is pretty much untraceable. The operations have been compromised over and over again. People are captured, people change sides, people just get sloppy. Many, many times they've seen the code pads, they've seen the receivers. The fact that the other side knows that this is how they do it does not give them any more access to the information. It's a perfect system in that respect. Some stations get jammed, presumably by rivals who pinpointed the transmitter site using sophisticated techniques. A numbers enthusiast has to rely on intensive listening to pick up any clues. Most of what you hear in the United States does come from Cuba. The Cuban stuff started right after Castro got in and started getting tensions in that area. It has gone on since. The engineering is sloppy. Tapes stop in the middle. Tapes are played backwards. They play Radio Havana by mistake. Radio Havana plays them by mistake. You get the idea they're just barely on top of the situation, but they keep at it. There's another Spanish numbers lady who is widely heard in North America. Some numbers monitors claim to have traced the signal to a government transmitter site in Warrington, Virginia. They call her Cynthia, as in starts with a C and ends with IA. Havana Moon just came out of nowhere. He just started writing one day about the shortwave numbers, and his stuff was extremely provocative, and it seemed to come from straight inside. The only thing he would ever say about himself was that he was a retired intelligence type, a real trench coat, cloak and dagger spook. There is some connection between the operations in Warrington, Remington, and uh, CIA, and maybe the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency. Havana Moon was a gentleman named William Godby. He was a retired naval personnel, and he was just a very nice gentleman to know. Havana Moon, who died in 1996, found a co-conspirator in John Fulford, an ex-police intelligence officer with an interest in radio's dark side. During the late 1980s, they roamed around Florida with a radio direction finder. He confided in me that he suspected there was one, possibly two, transmitter sites in South Florida. He had an idea where a couple of them were. Uh, we took some equipment out. I set the direction finder up. We took some bearings over a couple of weeks. Where the bearing lines crossed was right around a military transmitter site located uh, in one of the airports here in South Florida. We drove right to the airport. When the transmitters came on, the radio nearly jumped out of our hands. Uh, the signal was so loud. So we figured right there we had it. During the day, the Navy sent standard traffic over this transmitter. Located at West Palm Beach International Airport, its frequency was just three kilohertz away from the numbers transmission. The antennas were beamed down into the Caribbean. Who sent the traffic would have no idea. It is an unmanned site sent over a telephone line from parts unknown. I would have no idea. Obviously, uh, one of the intelligence agencies. My name is John R. Winston. I'm the assistant bureau chief of the Enforcement Bureau, Federal Communications Commission. We don't intend to discuss these stations, if any exist at all, and I'm not saying there are if you're signed to say there are those that are transmitting in this country. We know of innumerable ones outside of this country. Our only interest is if they are causing interference, we then work with the country of transmission to seek solution. Well, you can't hide a transmitter. Cryptographer Bruce Schneier. Now, remember what a number station is doing. It's hiding the location of the recipient. The location of the transmitter is not necessarily a secret. The person who is receiving it is somewhere, and we don't know where. Every night in the week in Europe, you could hear these weird gongs sound like some sort of church bells out of tune. But that was part of the stars of stations. Simon Mason discovered the numbers in much the same way I did. By the mid-80s, he'd begun to seriously document the European number scene from his home in Kingston upon Hall in England. There's been this spy uncovered in my home city, and I know what he was listening to when he was under the uh, control of the Stasi, the East German secret police. But God knows what his wife and kids thought when they heard his gong coming out of his kitchen. <laughs> Five months after the Berlin Wall fell, 
the gong station went off the air forever. By and large, a lot of the big players in the Cold War era have gone now. And there's a lot of activity now in the Far East. The strangest one of the lot has got to be the one from Taiwan. Writer Hugh Stegler. It's called New Star Broadcasting, and it has this lady who they tell me even in that culture is way, way too enthusiastic. And she's been computerized, and she comes out of the machine. She says things like, good morning, please decode your message. This is all in Mandarin, of course. She says things like, thank you very much for decoding today's message. I hope you have a nice day. I mean, she's being nice to the spies. You gotta love it. That this station is so over the top leads Stegman to think that the purpose is less for transmitting secret messages than for spreading disinformation. Just this colossal diversion so that the mainland Chinese will think that Taiwan has put hundreds and hundreds of agents into that country, which they might or might not have done. I would say that's maybe why half these agencies do it this way. It makes two guys in a government office in some crummy building without water somewhere sound like, you know, they're on a level with the CIA. Everybody sounds the same on shortwave. Most monitors seem sure that the number stations are a part of international espionage, but some signals remain elusive. There are a few strange stations, I must admit, like the buzzer on 4625 kilohertz. Simon Mason says the buzzer has been going for at least 20 years. It stopped only once for a live numbers message on Christmas Eve in 1997. Maybe he's just keeping this frequency up in, in case some sort of world disaster happens and then they can take over with uh, just a simple shortwave setup. After all, the satellites are being blown out of the sky. Just like a notepad and paper left behind in case your computer crashes. I think it's just the biggest conceptual art project, unintentional or otherwise, that anybody ever made. It puts Crystal and those guys to shame. It's planetary. I listen to shortwave these days with a bit of a pang. It's fading out, regarded as archaic by many international broadcasters. Yet the number stations persist. Sometimes when I hear one, I write down some of the groups and wonder who the message is for and what it might say. Meet your contact. Blow up the bridge. Don't blow up the bridge. Maybe it's just keep listening. David Gorin is a radio producer living in Brooklyn. He had production help from Chris Smolinski, Kirill Wheeler, Akeen Fernandez, and Erdial Discs, Jonathan Marks, and Radio Netherlands. You're listening to NPR.